Hi there, you still have some spare time for timing? Rest assured that I will be running out of puns soon. In the previous video on timing in HEMA and fencing in general, we covered two main topics. First, we got an idea why timing is an issue in martial arts in the first place. The reason being that if a fencer commits to a body movement, a step, a cut with weapon, a parry, a recover and so on, they are kind of stuck in this motion because of their inertia for a certain time or tempo. We call this a single continuous movement or motion. The opponent may use the time of this movement to their advantage. Second, we had a closer look at the right moment, as we called it. This is the moment when we initiate a counter against our opponent who, busy as they are with a certain fencing action, cannot react with a counter counter. On our diagram, such an indes or mezzo tempo or contratempo action looked like this. After a bit of reaction time passing, the reaction starts and has to come to a successful completion before the opponent can react to it, meaning that we have the remaining time of their action plus their reaction time for their hopefully unsuccessful counter counter. Completing our counter ideally means that we end up with an advantage over our opponent, possibly a direct threat or even a hit. I said in the last video that uh, this is pretty much the easiest uh, case of using timing intentionally to your advantage. If you watch a couple of HEMA videos with sparring or tournament footage, you will see this being employed almost constantly. People lurk around, waiting for their opponent to take one step too many or do a premature attack, and then they see their chance and go for a strike themselves. This is historically correct to some degree. Salvatore Fabris writes in his 1606 de lo schermo o vero scienza d'arme, right at the beginning of book 2, that most fencers wait for a tempo of their opponent. They do this because this is much easier than taking the initiative themselves, as this would often make them vulnerable. But then again, taking the initiative ought to put your opponent into obedience, so it's a thing we should be striving for. The oldest representation of the German Lichtenau tradition of the late Middle Ages emphasizes attacking first quite a lot for this very reason. So apparently they considered it to be doable, at least for a trained fighter. But as Fabris points out himself, it takes some skill to attack first without offering the opponent a tempo while doing so. In this video, we will find out how we can move against the opponent without giving them an easy chance to get an advantage over us. To that end, we will compile a handful of suggestions to improve our time management. The last video was easy, but now things will become more intense. So intense, in fact, I, that I have to state some propositions, just so we're on the same page. This is a digest of the foundation of my thinking about martial arts and basically the one we have at Dimicator and at the Dimicator Schola. And hopefully you will agree with all of these points. First, a functional martial system provides the most efficient solutions to the most serious threats posed by the opponent. If their threats are less serious, one can opt for a simpler solution. Maybe these are not even spelled out in the source you're using. This assumes that you are facing your opponent and are ready to act. The system is not incomplete, a phrase that is flying around in HEMA discussions frequently, just because it doesn't provide uh, me with a solution against, say, an attack while I am dozing in my hammock. Second, there are no gaps, meaning that there should be no situation to which you have no solution. Instead, the system should have overlaps, which means that in uncertain situations, both of the two next best solutions should work. Third, you strive to constantly create predicaments or catch-22 situations for your opponent. If they do nothing against your plan A, they get hit. If they counter it, you already know that plan B comes into play. This way you have very simple choices to make and hardly end up with three equally valid options. Fourth, the ideal fighter should be aware of every single action they perform. Nothing ought to happen accidentally. They should know how long their own actions last, how much distance they cover, and the same even for the opponent's actions. They need this awareness to calculate which steps to take next to shut out the nearest potential threat and sometimes even go for the earliest possible strike to eliminate the opponent altogether. Fifth, this belongs to part four in fact, but as it will be uh, rather important later, I'm going to highlight it now. Ideally, if a fighter commits to an action, if they decide to go for it, they do it because they are certain that it will succeed. 
If they want to strike, for example, they do so when they know that the opponent's defense will be too late. This also means that their actions have to be short and quick enough to keep the chance of success high. I know this sounds a bit strict and idealized, but if you want to be good at your martial discipline, uh, fighting according to your gut feeling can only get you so far. You will find a lot of what is to come in this video not only in our historical sources, but also in contemporary Olympic fencing tuition. And if even a thoroughly sportified and incredibly fast and athletic discipline such as Olympic fencing works as structured and as systematically, uh, you can bet that martial arts designed for life and death situations did so too. But enough with the banter, let's get to the examples. We will start with a practical example. How many single continuous actions does the following move have? One might think a simple Oberhau with a long sword and a passing step is one action, hence one tempo, right? Let's see in how many places this Oberhau can be countered. Three times. In this example, which is probably not exhaustive, we showed three different points in time where the Oberhau could be countered and rendered ineffective. We talked about subjective and objective tempi in the last video, as you might remember. Our subjective impression might be that the Oberhau is one tempo, but objectively, or to the opponent, there are three tempi or moments to strike. Well, in reality, in a certain situation, they will choose one of these as the most appropriate, but in principle, all three are possible. By the way, these three possible counters might remind you of certain lists of right moments to strike that uh, exist in some martial arts, uh, be it in a 16th century fight book from Italy, as demonstrated in a video by Martin Höppner, or even halfway around the globe in karate, as you can see in another video. Before the opponent strikes, while they strike, after their attack, these are recurring situations where a counter might be successful, and you can keep them in mind as rules of thumb if you like. However, we want to go a little deeper and thereby also learn how to improve our Oberhau with a passing step. Remember that one conclusion from our first video on timing? In the end, you don't decide about the tempi of your actions, the opponent does. To put it simple, Every notably different point in time in which a serious counter can disturb your motion belongs to a different single continuous action, or tempo, running at that time. Or to express it a bit fancier, they each have a different quality in our timing framework. To prevent the opponent from taking our one large tempo at whatever stage seems appropriate to them, we have to, like, preemptively subdivide it into smaller, more manageable parts. This way, we are prepared to react at every single one of these stages. On our timeline, this looks like this. As you can see, we gain more moments of stillness between the individual parts of the technique. As you remember, in moments of stillness, we can adjust to the situation and decide the next move. Feasible moments of stillness in this example are before the raising of the weapon, before the cut, and after the cut when the fighter starts to recover. Our longsword fighter can now evaluate the situation before each tempo. If the opponent does not initiate any harmful counteraction until that point, he can proceed with his plan A. Plan A is to conquer the central space between the fighters with the right Oberhau and threaten with a thrust to the face in the follow-up action. Right before the actual strike, our fighter evaluates the situation. If the opponent has not started placing their weapon in the way of our Oberhau, uh, our fighter commits to the strike. As the raising of his weapon and the first part of his step have been placed in the previous tempo, the Oberhau itself plus step now is a rather short action. Thus, the opponent has only very little time to counter it. In fact, if they counter just a little too late, our fencer strike will have achieved what it wanted. For example, lock the opponent's weapon out of the center. As the tempo of the strike has ended, he is again ready to act depending on the situation. Now, let's rewind a bit and go back right before the strike. Our fencer is still in his brief moment of stillness. If he now perceives the opponent to start a counter or anything else, 
he can adjust to it and act accordingly, thus moving while or indem the opponent tries their thing. If you feel like this is getting too complicated, just rewind this video and watch it a second time. Or watch the entire thing twice. Or ask a question in the comments. Meanwhile, let's draw some advice from this first example. First, subdivide your actions, especially long ones, into small parts, each of which can ideally be completed in such a short time that the opponent has barely any chance to counter. Second, use the moments of stillness that appear as last-second evaluation opportunities. They are your points of no return. As soon as you pass them, things usually are decided upon. Eventually, you will tailor your entire system with all the small weapon motions and different kinds of steps so that you are able to threaten the opponent while being constantly able to adapt to changing situations. Please note that uh, the practical examples presented here are to illustrate certain points I want to make. The actual fencing could be done differently, and there is usually some leeway regarding the way of structuring the fight. If you adhere to the important rules and principles, that is. What should have become clear from our Oberhau example is that there is almost no chance of successfully completing the Oberhau plus passing step if our fencer commits to it right at the beginning of the clip. This leads us to our second topic. We learned in the first video that getting the right moment isn't much good if your clever counteraction is much longer than the tempo your opponent is giving you. Before you have completed your counter, they are already back in the game and making your life hell. This applies to any fighting action or single continuous action. You want to commit to an action only if you are certain that you can finish it in less time than your opponent needs for their quickest counter or attack and that you have gained an advantage when you have ended that action. Let's get back to our Oberhau example from before and add another dimension to it. While raising the weapon and before the strike, as a fencer, we need to make the following uh, calculation. Can the opponent, from where they are now, either threaten us, even in a suicidal way, or destroy our Oberhau in the same time that we need for our strike, or even in less time? If the answer is yes, then the strike's tempo would be too long and we have to do something else. If the calculation ends in favor of the Oberhau, we make a last second decision, just as demonstrated earlier. If the opponent has not started doing anything funny, we proceed with the Oberhau, and ideally, anything they do to counter it will be too late. If it happens that the opponent starts moving while we are still in a moment of stillness, we react to them using their tempo, slash we are reacting in them they perform their action. A good rule of thumb regarding this tempo against tempo calculation comes from an anonymous text describing Italian rapier fighting from the early 17th century, mostly in the tradition of Fabris, but also with a bit of Capoferro. When preparing for a thrust, the author states, you want to commit to it only when the distance between the point of your rapier and the target is shorter than the distance between your blade and the opponent's strong part of the blade with which they defend. This is a special case that applies to rapier, but it is based on the same principle as above. You want to ensure that even if both of you started at the same time and the opponent's only goal was to destroy your action, yours would still be fast enough to succeed. In fighting practice, there is more to this than mere distance. For example, dominating the opposing blade in a bind means that they need more time before they can counter you, which gives you slightly more time meaning you can cover more distance. Attacking an opening that is far away from their weapon also means that you have more time before they can get their defense in between. If any of your interpretations of a historical technique has a really low chance of success because it can be easily countered, or if it is extremely susceptible to a suicidal counterattack, you might want to tweak little details like the positions from which you start, where you have your moments of stillness, how you use measure, and so on. You can set up really simple but effective experiments to see whether an action can be completed successfully in the way you understand it. If you like, you can use the same setup for games in your training, in which you try to find out what techniques or actions still work 
wherein the training partner is allowed to react as soon as they notice a movement. You can change the configuration by choosing different starting positions for the attacker or defender and by setting up rules of what to do if the defender reacts too early. Such games will not only raise awareness of the lengths of different fencing actions, but they can also help you calibrate your techniques and distance management. As a side note, if you find yourself in a situation where the opponent can quickly close all lines of attack, you may want to use a feint to trigger their defensive reflexes and then use the tempo of their reaction for a strike. But be careful, a feint is a tempo too, so keep it short and controlled that you can follow up quickly. The previous example has mostly dealt with the opponent's defense as a possible obstacle to one's own action. A reckless counterattack is an even greater obstacle and more difficult to prevent, but preparing for it is based on the same principles. Even the most drugged up suicidal daredevil can hardly move through time and space faster than a trained fencer. So if you have learned how much time your actions take, you can make sure that your actions always come at a time when the opponent cannot use them against you. At the same time, your actions are short enough and completed quickly so that you regain your ability to adapt. One example that could be interpreted as a last second defense against a possible maniac attack comes from a fencing lesson by Johann Georg Paschen in a fight book that belongs to the tradition of Salvatore Fabris, again, that old timing mastermind. We will come back to that book later. In any case, Paschen gives the following fencing lesson. You approach the opponent and are now too tempy away from striking. We will later see why that is the case. You spend the first action with securing their blade and moving your foot forward. After that, you only need one more tempo to strike by putting the foot on the ground and leaning forward. This means as soon as the foot is moved forward, you have reached a brief moment of stillness. If there is no signal to the contrary, you have permission to strike, as it were. Now, one of the options Passion gives is that the opponent now tries to disengage. This could be a perfectly valid, although very late attempt at regaining control, but it is also possible that they just want to thrust us in the belly, despite the risk of a double hit. Now, what should we do? We could hope that it was just a disengage, but this means we would have to wait for the blade to come back up again on the other side. Otherwise, we would impale ourselves on their blade while we strike. The latter is no acceptable option, but neither is waiting. What Passion then describes is what uh, if we see the opponent going down with our point, we quickly follow it and push it further aside while we strike in the same tempo. This means we don't have to wait, and it doesn't matter whether they tried a late disengage or a suicidal double hit. By the way, Fabris himself suggests a different move in a slightly different situation, but uh, where we have the same potential danger of being attacked below. In his example, he intercepts the blade halfway. Now, for the sake of completeness, let's do a cross-check. What if we decided to strike because we did not get any clue that the opponent was up to something, and in the very same moment they start their disengagement or attempted double hit? As you can see, in this case we would bridge distance quickly enough to get past the opponent's point, thereby avoiding the risk of a serious injury. As you can see, our timing calculation worked. We decided, based on the information available, and as the action we were planning was short enough, we were able to uh, beat them to the punch, as it were. If you decide for the right thing at the right moment, there should be no punishment. Otherwise, the whole system would be flawed. Personally, I really like the logic of a well-thought-out timing framework. Uh, but wait, there is even more. Well, not so fast. Here is yet another edition from the future. I've talked about those strange definitions of tempo by Capoferro in the previous video, and I think that now, finally, it is time to address them. So, what does the motion of my adversary with his body measures the stillness of the point of my sword mean? I think we just covered this topic, and with the help of what we learned in the first video on timing in Hema, it should not be as cryptic anymore as before. Capoferro defines tempo as a just length of motion or of stillness that I need in order to reach a definite end for some plan of mine. This is regardless of how long this tempo actually takes. What matters is that it is just, which means that if you want to complete an action, your opponent needs to give you exactly the time you need for it.
either by resting or by moving. Capoferro explains this as follows. We pose the example that I move myself to seek the measure, and that I go very slowly to find it, and that my adversary is as much fixed of body so that I find it. Although I have arrived somewhat late, nonetheless not at all can it jeopardize my plan, because I have arrived in tempo, considering that as much length of time as I am myself in motion, precisely so much had my adversary fixed himself. Thus my motion equals the tempo of the stillness of my adversary, and his stillness measures my motion precisely. And because, in remaining in guard and seeking the measure, only the correspondence of the tempo that the combatants mutually consume in moving and in fixing themselves is to be considered. And so on and so forth. In a way, if you will, he uses the same simplification of uh, the tempo framework as Salvatore Fabris, according to whom the action I want to perform must be as long as the tempo that my opponent gives me, for instance by moving his weapon or his feet, and I should not take longer than that. We have seen before that in reality even well-made fencing actions tend to come with a slight temporal offset or delay, so these units of fencing actions do not line up perfectly, but as a rule of thumb this definition still works. Capoferro elaborates a bit later that, now, so that this tempo may be just, it is necessary that for as much length of tempo as the body of my adversary is fixed, for so much is the point of my sword to be moved, which means I assume that continuing to advance when your opponent starts moving is a bad idea, as this means they are probably reacting to you and you should be prepared for that, which you are likely not if your motion continues. Capoferro continues with this example. I find myself in wide measure, with a will to come to narrow measure. Now I move the point of my sword in order to arrive at the set terminus. Meanwhile, as I move myself, it is necessary that my adversary fix his body, and thus the stillness of body of my adversary is the measure of the movement of the point of my sword. And, however, if I moved myself to strike before the adversary finished fixing himself, because the tempo would be unequal, I would move myself in vain, or not without great danger to myself. I assume this means that if I try to prepare a thrust from narrow measure, meaning that the thrust itself is supposed to be a very short and quick action that comes after my tempo of preparation, it would be best if my opponent had finished their stillness, uh, for instance started moving, as this would give me a tempo to strike. As soon as they start moving, their stillness ends, which means that my own tempo of advancing into narrow measure must also come to an end. In a sense, therefore, the length of their stillness measures for how long I can advance. If I continue to come forward even though they start moving, this might be dangerous, as their action could be a counter to my advancing, and I would be unable to react to that. There are a few more aspects to Capoferro's tempo definitions, um, just as the emphasis he places on moving in a composed fashion so that body and weapon can move quickly together, but that is not as relevant for our topic at hand. I hope what I just said makes his remarks a bit clearer, even though I can only offer the way I interpret them. So, but for now, let's get back to the rest of the video. In some fight books, timing is considered in conjunction with measure or the distance between the two fighters. Nicoletto Giganti briefly explains the two in a single chapter, and even the mnemonic verses of the much older Lichtenauer tradition declare that alle Dinge haben länger und Maße. All things have length and measure. For the specialists among you, the term mass is in fact used for measure in the oldest Lichtenauer manuscript. There is a good reason for considering timing and measure together. Advancing on your opponent or retreating means you have to cover distance, and that in turn means you need time for that. It's the same as with your weapon or a hand that takes time when moving from point A to point B. What we have learned so far about timing and single continuous movements, or tempi, suggests that we have to treat steps in the same way. When they get too long, the opponent may be able to execute more than one action and thus get an advantage. That is, while we may surprise them in the first half of the movement, when they still have to process the change of situation, they will probably get a chance to counter in the second half. Therefore, subdivision is a good idea here as well. There are different kinds of steps described in the historical sources, some of which can be subdivided into at least two parts. If that doesn't work with the exact stepping mechanics you are using, it might be worth to tweak them until they allow for a subdivision. I mean, what do you have to lose? 
A two-part step can still usually be done in one go if the situation re requires it. In contrast, trying to make a very long step work in fencing means you have two options. Either you become superhumanly fast, or you only use them in contexts where the opponent cannot use them to their advantage. For instance, if they too take very long steps. From my experience, it takes quite some time to relearn steps. And many of us, including myself, grew up with this idea of a step as a means to propel oneself forward in a more or less explosive motion. And for most of the time, our equally unskilled opponents were unable to counter this um, appropriately. After all, a quick leap forward can be intimidating. But sooner or later, a skilled fighter will mercilessly exploit the situation when their opponent rushes in without regard for their tempi. Mind you that by rushing in, I mean a single step. Now, what does it say about people who literally run in a fight? Now, you might wonder if I make all of this up and if these are merely armchair observations that have no relevance for fighting practice, uh, nor any reflection in the historical sources. Well, lucky us, they have. While I personally know these concepts from my Olympic fencing coach, as I already stated, we do have evidence of this in the fight books as well. One of the clearest descriptions of such a way of structuring your approach and the awareness of all these timing-related intricacies comes, again, from the tradition of Sabato Fabris. In his 1606 book, Fabris describes the two main distances between the fighters, the misura stretta, or narrow measure, in which you are so close to the opponent that you can wound them with a thrust by leaning forward, and the misura larga, or wide measure, which is one short step further away. If you secure the opponent's blade in the wide measure, you would think you can lunge and make a hit, because that's how rapier fencing works, right? Bummer, that didn't work. Despite this being a very quick lunge, the opponent managed to, one, realize what's going on, two, neutralize your dominance in the bind, and three, displace your point, and maybe even repost. If that isn't a clear example of the enemy decides how many tempi you use, then I don't know what is. Also, remember one of our premises for fighting in general. We should not commit to an action if we are not at least mostly certain that we can succeed. Therefore, objecting that, well, the other person knew it was coming, so it doesn't count, does not count. We assume that there's always the chance that the opponent does the right thing, even accidentally. So our interpretation of a fighting system needs to be able to deal with those um, possibilities. Let's hear how Fabris himself explains the problem. If you are in the misura larga and want to gain the misura stretta while the opponent is static in his guard, the danger is considerable. As soon as you lift your foot to move it forward, the opponent may use that as a tempo in which to wound you, while pulling back out of danger in the misura larga, thus nullifying any advantage you try to take. The reason for this is that a foot cannot be moved in less than two tempi, one to lift it and the other to put it back on the ground. Some, to get around this shortcoming, slide the foot forward without lifting it. This may be easily performed in the sal, but then a street would cause you to stumble on one of the many impediments. Thus, it is better to always lift it carefully, making sure that nothing will trip you up. Oh my, just after we thought we would only have to subdivide long passing steps, there comes Fabris stating that every foot movement is at least two tempi. Well, there is an exception even to that, but we will come back to that in a later video. What Fabris suggests now is supposed to work against a static opponent. This is the most dangerous situation, because they can easily react any time, because they are still, minus a bit of reaction time. If we manage to come up with a way of proceeding against them, any less dangerous situation, an opponent giving us a tempo, for example, should be even easier to solve. You might remember this to be one of our general fighting premises. Fabris suggests to secure the opponent's blade so that they cannot strike in one single tempo. This is the prerequisite for anything that follows. Then, the fighter ought to carefully lift the front foot without coming any closer and wait for a split second. By doing so, our fighter is subdividing his one step, doing only the first half. If the opponent now tries something funny, our fighter is in a brief phase of stillness and thus can adapt to whatever the opponent does. If they do nothing, 
The foot is placed down and the body leans forward for a strike, because now the remaining second tempo is short enough that the opponent will be hit before they manage to free their blade. While this description is easily overread in Fabris's book from 1606, it is repeatedly used in a book that I already mentioned earlier, a German text by a student of Fabris, probably Heinrich von Unzumfelder, and ever since Renier van Nord and Jan Schäfer have provided an English translation of the text, uh, these intricacies have become accessible to a larger audience in the Hema Rapier community. Interestingly, in this text, the approach with the front foot being suspended in the air, or suspeso in aria, is called a particular secret in fencing, or in the original German, ein sonderliches Arcanum im Fechten, which sounds like it wasn't really part of every fencer's repertoire. Indeed, there were other authors of books on rapier fighting who apparently did not subdivide their lunges, and we will have a look at these in the next video, hopefully. As a side note, it is not entirely clear to me whether in the Fabris approach there's also the option to place the front foot down as part of the first tempo, which could work just as well, and I think it was mentioned at some point. Uh, more often, however, and especially in the Heinrich von Unzumfelde text, uh, they seem to work with the front foot uh, moved forward but floating above the ground. Frankly, when years ago I first read that passage about lifting the foot and putting it down was too tempy, I did not really get it, and I just vaguely filed it under, wow, these rapierists are really fuzzy. But now I think it is a clear manifestation of the awareness of those people uh, regarding the intricacies of timing. Whether you like it or not, Committing to an action, while there is a notable degree of uncertainty about its chance of success, is a bad idea if you strive for control in a fight. And if staying in control means you have to tailor your footwork to your weapon actions or that of the opponent, then this is the way to go. Good footwork also means that you neither move for a long period before the motion of your weapon nor too long after it, always assuming that uh, these are like single continuous movements or tempi. In both cases, you occupy yourself with stepping for a much longer period than necessary, thereby limiting your options to react. It is true that you might be able to react with your weapon while your feet are moving, or vice versa. But more often than not, uncontrolled stepping will also prevent you from reacting with your weapons. My saber teacher, for example, taught me to synchronize my parry with the end of my step backwards, because this means I can advance again right after the parry and I don't have to collect my feet first, as it were, uh, which would cost me time. You will see, therefore, that sometimes the movement of hand and foot fall together, because they are squeezed within one short tempo, and in other cases, hand and foot move with a slight temporal offset. This depends on the situation, the kinds of steps used in the system, the properties of the weapon used, as a long sword has to be handled much differently than a small sword, and so on and so forth. But welding, as it were, a short weapons action together with a long step, making it look like the entire tempo is one large block, might be a sign of someone not knowing what triggers each of these motions and where their respective places are in a fight. By the way, the plurality of options are why I have abandoned using uh, George Silver's terms true time and false time for anything except for his own system. I have read his paradoxes a while ago, but frankly, I have no idea right now how exactly he structures a fight, uh, what footwork he uses, and what must be done in one continuous action according to him. And I think that it is precarious to discuss these terms without regard for these aspects. If you want to use a rule of thumb like uh, the arm is extended before the step, as I also learned it first in Olympic fencing, I would say that specifically this one applies primarily to single tempo actions that require a weapon movement. The weapon is usually faster than the foot, so if the quickest way to deflect a threat or establish control is by moving the weapon, then the weapon, of course, has to come first. But you can still start a composite fencing technique with the foot first, but if a weapon action follows, this should be uh, regarded uh, as a new tempo, and this tempo in turn probably starts with the weapon movement. If you ever heard the advice to start an action slow and finish it fast, it refers to this idea of having a tempo of preparation, for example by moving a foot forward but keeping the weapon in reserve, and then strike as soon as either the opponent gives you a tempo or you are close enough to strike uh, that they have no time to defend. Start slow and finish fast thus refers to two actions in our timing framework, and this also means that if something happens after the first tempo, you can still abandon plan A and go for plan B.
By the way, almost everything that I just said refers to advancing on your opponent. If you have to retreat, there's usually no downside to stepping first, as this buys you more time. Of course, if they follow you, closing in and getting past their point in order to wrestle could also be an option. I hope these examples have demonstrated that there is much more to footwork than just moving around without tripping over your own feet. Footwork is supposed to bring your body to the right place at the right time, so you can use its strength and its structure where and when it is needed. But the right time can be a matter of split seconds. It can be there when your foot is still in the air, but gone when you have placed it on the ground. I think it is time now to wrap things up. In the first video, we looked at the biomechanical foundation of timing theories and analyzed the example of hitting the right moment in which our opponent is caught off guard. In the second video, we have ventured further and learned to structure our own approach in a way that should make it impossible for the opponent uh, to catch us off guard. We do this by subdividing our actions, at least the long body motions, so that the opponent has hardly any chance of using our tempi against us, while we create a lot of brief moments of stillness, uh, which allows us to decide whether we can proceed as planned or have to adapt to whatever the opponent does. There are too many practical applications of this, so instead of giving more examples, I would merely present to you some questions that might help you with uh, tweaking your fighting actions in training. My idea is that they have to be answered for every single continuous fighting action. First, what is the fastest action the opponent can take to either destroy my attack or threaten me? Second, can I land a hit before they can defend or establish a threat? If not, what is the fastest action I can perform that defends against their fastest possible attack and allows me to gain an advantage? As you can see, these two bullet points concern the whole idea of time calculation, that is, performing actions that are quicker than those of the opponent, and um, not getting stuck in an overly long body movement. Three, after the action to which I am committing has ended, will I be able to reasonably continue in the new changed situation? Because obviously, I don't want to arrive at dead end, uh, where defending and or striking is not possible anymore. There surely are many more aspects to this, more criteria you can come up with, and more analogies and metaphors helping you to grasp certain aspects of timing. You will have to experience these things with your body to get a working idea of what timing is about. I could not do this with a video anyway, although I hope that our uh, theoretical concepts and idealized constellations will give you at least a rough idea. One can go even deeper, push timing theories to their limits, and find out why different martial arts solve timing issues differently, but uh, I will save this for the next video. So, take care everyone, and goodbye. Ich hab mich erinnert, wie das früher war. Nein.